Particle physics is a story. It is a story that has been developing our entire history. From Greek philosophers postulating the atom to Rutherford's discovery of the atomic nucleus and to the discovery of the subatomic particles that make up protons and neutrons. As we add to this story, it becomes more complicated and richer, but underneath it all is a great mathematical simplicity. We call this the standard model of particle physics, and it gives us these fundamental particles shown here. They are fundamental because, as far as we can tell, they have no internal structure. The particles on the left are called fermions. They are the matter particles, and you can think of them like stuff. One that you might recognize is the electron. The two lightest quarks, the up and the down quarks, are the ones that make up protons and neutrons. The particles on the right are called bosons, and they carry the forces. Again, one you might recognize is the photon, and this is a particle of light, and it carries the electromagnetic force. Up until recently, there was a missing piece to this model, something that was predicted by the mathematics behind all of these particles. In July 2012, we were treated to a summer blockbuster in this story, the final piece in the hunt for the Higgs boson. On the French-Swiss border, close to the city of Geneva, the biggest experiment ever built by humans was at the center of attention. For a little over two years, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, also called the LHC, had been taking protons and accelerating them to almost the speed of light, both directions, around a 27-kilometer-long tunnel, and then smashing them together in the center of carefully constructed detectors. Here is one of those detectors, and indeed it's the experiment that I work on. It's called the Atlas detector, and it's one of two general purpose detectors on the LHC, which you can think of like a giant particle camera. It's 44 meters long and 25 meters high. At, seven, at 1,000 tons, it weighs as much as 100 747 airplanes. In fact, it's so big that I had to make a slight alteration to the standard unit of measuring, the person. Although I might get in trouble with a certain few scientific friends for putting people and dinosaurs in the same diagram. So how does this particle camera work? Well, often the first particle created in the proton collisions, like the Higgs boson, it doesn't live for very long, and it quickly changes into lighter particles. To find out what this first particle was, we have to measure these secondary particles that come out in all directions. So to do its job, Atlas is made up of layers, like an onion. And we'll start from the center and work our way out, like the particles. So this is called the tracker. When a particle with an electric charge passes through, it leaves electrons in the tracker, showing where it's gone. When we combine this with a magnet, which bends lighter, slower particles, more than heavier, faster ones, we now start to learn something about the particle's mass. Also, since negatively charged particles bend one way and positively charged particles the other, we now know something about the particle's charge. The next section of our detector, or layer of the onion, is called the calorimeter, and it measures the energy of the particles. Up until this point, we've tried not to destroy anything, but now the only way to accurately measure the energy of the particles is to get it to give it up. We do this by alternating layers of an absorber, such as lead, to get the, uh, the particle to release its energy, and layers of a detecting material to measure it. After these sections, we should only have two types of particles left, 
from our standard model. The first of these are muons, and these are the heavier cousins of electrons. They are 200 times more massive and very difficult to stop. So we have a layer on the outside of our detector called the muon detector, which just measures these particles. The second type of particles we have left are called neutrinos. These are extremely light and don't interact with any part of our detector, and so they travel all of the way out. The only way we know that they are there is from the conservation of momentum, mass times velocity. This tells us that if we have a lot of momentum in this direction and not so much in this direction, it should have been equal, and so there must have been neutrinos over here. So once we add all of this information up, the mass, the charge, the energy, and a few extra details, we have the identity of that first particle that was created. But let's step back and take a look at probably Einstein's most famous equation, E equals mc squared. In this equation, E is energy, as shown by the coffee cup. M is the rest mass of a particle, and C is the universal speed limit, the speed of light in a vacuum. What this equation tells us is that energy and mass are equivalent, and we can exchange one for the other. Indeed, this is how a nuclear fission reactor works. It takes a small amount of mass and creates a large amount of energy. By contrast, at the LHC, when the protons are accelerated to close to the speed of light, the quarks and the gluons inside them contain a lot of energy. When we collide them together, we can use this energy to create new particles like the Higgs boson. In fact, this is why it took so long to discover. We needed more energy to create the Higgs bosons. And also, we needed to create a lot of Higgs bosons to see them over the noise of all of the other particles created, because it's a very rare event. But fortunately, at the LHC, we collide protons at the rate of a billion times per second. As with any great sequel, the next part of our story needs to be bigger. The LHC has been switched off for the last two years to prepare for the next period of data taking. We're increasing its center of mass energy, that energy that comes from the collision of protons at very high speeds, by almost double. Also, by uh, packing the protons closer together inside the particle beam, the time between collisions will be halved. And this means we will have even more data to unravel our story. But this means a lot more work for the experiments. And the detectors have been using this time to become faster, more accurate in measuring the position and energy of particles, and also more resistant to the constant bombardment of newly created particles, which causes damage to our detector. But who are the characters in our new story? Well, like any good sequel, we need to tell you more about our lead from the first one. So we will be probing the Higgs boson to find out what its properties are and to see how it interacts with our standard model of particle physics. This is vital to really get to the heart of this newly discovered particle and see if it's hiding any secrets from us. But there are also new characters that will drive our plot, and there are many more mysteries left to uncover. The first of these is the case of the missing antimatter. The antimatter theory was first suggested in a paper by scientist Paul Dirac in 1928. He was trying to combine special relativity, the world of the very fast, with quantum mechanics, the world of the very small, into one single equation. And he got a very strange result that predicted a whole new set of particles. Five years later, he was proven right when the very first antiparticle was discovered in, an, in a bubble chamber experiment. Particles like uh, the particles that make up you and me, electrons and protons, that's all matter. But for every, uh, every particle, there is a corresponding antiparticle, apparently identical, except that it has an opposite charge. So for the negatively charged electron, we have the positively charged anti-electron, also called a positron. 
When a particle and its antiparticle come together, they annihilate to create a lot of energy. And again, we see mass being exchanged into energy. But let's take a closer look at this bubble chamber uh, event. What you can see here is a charged particle passing through the experiment, and it actually leaves behind a trail of bubbles. And this is a photograph of those bubbles in the experiment. The section in the center is a lead plate, and this slows the particles down. So we know, what <coughs> so we know which direction it was traveling in. The particle actually came from the bottom, and after passing through the lead plate, it slowed down and is bent more by the magnet uh, in this experiment. What Carl Anderson found was that uh, this particle had exactly the same mass as an electron, but it was bent in the opposite direction, which meant that it had a positive charge rather than a negative charge. And this is the very first image of an antiparticle, the very first discovery of an antiparticle. But we don't see a lot of antimatter lying around, which is strange because we believe at the beginning of the universe, matter and antimatter were created in equal amounts. So one of the biggest questions in physics right now is if this is true, why are we here? Surely all of the matter and antimatter should have annihilated in the early universe to leave just a universe of light. There are suggestions that out in space, there are entire anti-galaxies. And if this was the case, if a galaxy and an anti-galaxy collided, we would expect to see a large amount of light from the annihilations between the particles and the antiparticles, which we just don't see. But even if they didn't collide, we would still expect to see helium nuclei escaping from the anti-galaxies, anti-helium nuclei escaping from the anti-galaxies. So we have experiments like the AMS detector on the International Space Station that are looking for uh, this anti-helium nuclei and counting matter and antimatter particles in space. But there's another theory that suggests that there is a small difference between the way matter and antimatter change into each other. And maybe this is why slightly, and I really mean slightly, more matter than antimatter survived. The LHCb detector at CERN will be looking for evidence of, these different, of this difference um, when the LHC switches back on. Now, moving from something missing that we can't explain to something extra that we can't explain, we also have the quest for the identity of dark matter. We know that dark matter exists. We can see evidence of it in the rotations of galaxies. To do this, we measure the amount of uh, hydrogen in a galaxy from the radio spectra coming from it. And this gives us a good idea of its uh, total standard matter content. We also measure the rotational speed of the galaxy. And when we do this, we find that the galaxies are spinning faster than they should do from the amount of matter in them. So there's something else there that we can't see with our telescopes holding those galaxies together. And we call it dark matter because we can't see it. Calculations predict that there is four times more dark matter in our universe than standard matter content, which is an awful lot of stuff to be missing. A very compelling theory known as supersymmetry suggests that there are a whole new set of particles. Now, I won't go into the names of these new particles because they start to get a little silly, like adding the S on the beginning of fermions to make supersymmetric particles known as squarks. But what this theory tells us is that uh, the supersymmetric particles would be more massive than their standard matter content, as shown in this image behind me. The figures in front of the mirror are the standard matter particles that we already know, and the superheroes within the mirror are their supersymmetric counterparts. The theory suggests that the, super, the lightest supersymmetric particle would interact very weakly with our standard matter, making it a good dark matter candidate. So we will also be looking for evidence of these particles to test this theory 
when the LHC switches on again soon. In a little over a week, the first beans since the LHC was shut off will start circulating again around that 27 kilometer long tunnel. In May, we will get the first collisions and the experiments will start taking data at greater rates and higher energies than we have ever seen before. So what will the story be for this new period of data taking? Will we get, will the second run of the LHC be about superheroes? The solved quest for the, uh, the missing antimatter? Or will we be treated to an M. Night Shyamalan style twist and get a new story entirely? I don't know about you, but I've already bought my front row seat. Thank you.